Good evening and welcome to St George's House in Conversation. Uh, I'm delighted that so many of you could join us uh, tonight. Now, some of you will know that St George's House has done a great deal of work over a good number of years on food and farming issues. Most recently, uh, work we have done in partnership with Sue Pritchard and the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission, when we hosted a series of consultations based on their 2019 landmark report, Our Future in the Land. And the purpose of those consultations was really to try and help take the debate forward to translate policy into the beginnings of practice. So it seemed to make a lot of sense uh, to have a conversation on food issues, which of course affect each and every one of us, not least in the light of Brexit, uh, in the ongoing debate on climate change, and indeed in many other areas of our daily, of our daily lives. So I'm delighted tonight uh, to have brought together Sue, Sue Pritchard from the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission, and Professor Tim Lang, who is an authority on food issues, respected nationally and indeed internationally. Uh, so I think without further ado, I will uh, leave the room virtually, as it were, and, and welcome both Sue and Tim and, and let them get on with this evening's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. It is such a pleasure for me to be here this evening, not least because those consultations at St George's House have been really important to us at the Food Farming Countryside Commission, being able to bring really interesting and diverse groups of people together to explore and debate these really, really critical questions. But of course, tonight I'm going to be in conversation with Tim Lang. I have to confess, let me confess immediately, and I think Tim secretly knows this, I am a complete fangirl of Tim Lang. And it is a great pleasure to be able to work with Tim in lots of different settings. Tim is, as, as well as um, Professor, Emeritus Professor now, I think, of food policy at City University. Tim's also um, on our Food Farming Countryside Commission Research Advisory Group. So I do benefit from his expertise and insight and intelligence and, uh, and wit, iconoclastic wit in all sorts of ways. Um, so um, I'm going to try and dampen down my fangirliness and get into the, the questions for this evening. Um, and I'm going to start out with um, a question that's prompted really by by Tim's latest book, you can see this is a heck of a tome, look at this, Tim's latest book, Feeding Britain, Our Food Problems and How to Fix Them. Um, and in, in this book, Tim, you talk, as many people do these days, about the food system. Do you want to start out by telling us what you mean by food system, what, what we all mean by the food system and why we talk about it in those terms these days? Thanks very much, Sue, and, and ditto. It's very nice uh, to be invited on this with you and also by Gary and St George's House. Much appreciated. Um, well, we use this term, the food system. Uh, when I was young and set out in this, we tended to use a different analogy. We did talk of the food system and it wasn't common parlance at all then, but we tended to explain it by the analogy of a jigsaw. If you want to understand the, the food system, you've got to understand all the bits of it how they connect, what the dynamics are, what the pipelines are, where the conflicts, where the lock-ins, where the synchronicities are. Um, and it just helps to have some sort of metaphor or um, model of thinking about that. And the, the term food system has come to mean that. And why I think that's useful is for the very obvious things so you know, and I'm sure all our listeners know, is that it's complicated. You know, some of the theories say, well, it's very simple. It's all about money, isn't it? It's just about cost, it's price, it's choice, leave it to the market. Well, those themselves become incredibly complicated. And inexorably, in the, the real world of food politics today, um, we have to talk about competing interests, not just farming in relation to consumption or farming in relation to retail power or different 
areas of the world, the rich world, the poor world, but it's also about competing interests. How do you weigh up what a good diet is? Is it about cost? Is it about health? Is it about the environment? Well, it's all of it actually, and more. So you end up being drawn back into this notion of the food system. And I think people get it actually. They get it now very quickly indeed, because people can see climate change. They can see COVID-19. Was it from animals or let out from a laboratory and then spread through animals to humans? You know, everything connects, as the great novelist Ian Forster said, everything connects. Well, it does in food. Food goes down our mouths, but it's got there by hundreds, thousands, millions of connections. So you end up using the analogy of a food system. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think you're, you're right. People are getting it these days. The events of the last couple of years alone, with the COVID-19 crisis and the impact of Brexit have just demonstrated to everybody, to all of us, how things that happen on another side of the world can have real world material impacts on what goes on in our plate but I want I want to get onto the problems now because you, you do a really good diagnosis of the problems you talk about the lock-ins of the problems in the current food system in in feeding Britain um, starting out with the money flow sending the wrong signals and food damaging the environment that it sits in I mean, I, I, it, it seems a bit kind of simplistic to say, what are the critical problems? I mean, all 12 of those are critical problems. But are there any that you would pick out that feel most critical at this particular point in time? Well, you're, you're kindly referring to, to my book. I mean, I, I ought to say in my own defence. I mean, I set out to write a small book for Penguin. <laughs> and the reason I did that, Sue, is not the one you think I'm going to say but is because after I did my PhD, uh, which was in 1970 to 73, 74, I swore I'd never work on anything big on my own ever again. It's just lonely. I like working with other people and food became my work and it's a collaboratory area. You can't understand it if you just have one set of expertise. So I, I set out to do, um, a, a book which was a bit like one written in 1938-39 uh, to Britain, which was looking at the system then and saying, holy Moses, we're in trouble. And they were right uh, for all sorts of reasons we don't need to go into. So I sat down to try and do that for the modern world and say, well, look, look I've worked on this for a long time with hundreds, thousands of other people. How can we make sense of it? And I thought, oh, well, not that off very quickly. You know, I'll do that in a year, half a year. Well, it took me two years. Uh, and I ended up doing what you've just alluded to, these 12 key problems that it seemed to me went to the heart of it. And you flagged the one that I think is actually, well, I'll, I'll force myself. I think it's the most important because it is about money flows. If I go and buy food, I'm, I, I used to be a farmer, as you know, and I think a lot about land use. Food is about from the land and the sea. But... The world is now urbanised, and I'm talking to you. I live in inner London, I have family in Wales and all over the place, etc. Um, it, it, you can say this is about money relations, but it's actually about power. And power is the thread that I have to deal with. The fact that in Britain, as I give the stats, government's own figures, uh, it's about farming gets about 7% of the gross value added from food. I mean, the Brits spend a quarter of a trillion pounds a year on food stuff, food and soft drinks, and farming gets 10, 12 billion of that. I mean, that's incredible, ludicrous. And if we don't, we can't expect all the ecological things to happen to link human health with ecosystems health. We can't expect inequalities in health or in society to be addressed through food. If we don't get that money question right, it seems to me um, nothing will work because money does make the world go round. And uh, the gross inequalities, you've now got three very powerful blocks. I'll give the British figures. It's uh, about a third each of the value added goes to catering, retailing, and food manufacturing. In food manufacturing, there are hundreds and thousands of firms. In retailing, it's nine. Nine companies 
have 94.5% of the latest figures I'll give you of the British market, 94%. Oh, that's of the retail market. And COVID-19, Sue, gave them the, 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 the hospitality market because the government closed it down. I mean, I colleagues and I wrote furious letters, sorry, polite evidence-based letters <laughs> to the prime minister and to the secretary of state for environment, food and real effects said, look, don't close it down, repurpose it, shift it. Many firms, small companies, small uh, farms deal with feeding the hospitality sector. Don't close it down, instead of which they gave them a present. And then people mm -hmm. insiders in the Whitehall and British government discussions say to me, Tim, the retailers now have the power. They've got it completely sewn up. Actually, money terms is not quite like that, actually. Look how the Brits want to go into pubs, want to go to restaurants. They've become European, actually. They may have voted just for Brexit. But actually, they like going out. They've become European in food culture. So the power battle between these three blocks is very critical. We've got to get a grip of that, and we're not at the moment. Yeah, I, I want to stick with the money and, and the visibility of the money, the, the transparency of the money for a moment longer, because um, I, I live uh, I'm, I live on a farm in Wales, as, as you know, Tim, and, uh, and equidistant between the Y and the USC. And I can't swim in the Y anymore because it is too polluted. polluted by one, chicken one, shit. one of the reasons that it is so badly polluted is the runoff from chicken sheds. And um, and it wasn't until I looked more closely into the story of the chicken sheds that the um, the opacity of the food system revealed itself even more to me. So. Um, it's it's Welsh farmers putting up lots of chicken sheds or actually English farmers too on either side of the River Wye. But actually, as I understand it, and if, if I've got this wrong, Tim, you'll correct me, I know, but as I understand it, the, the, the reason that so many chicken farms are appearing around the Wye is because Cargill, a, a huge global business, has um, decided for reasons of efficiency to consolidate its poultry production in this kind of an area where it can grow chickens and process chickens and sell chickens and export chickens out of Japan, it turns out, um, in, in a super efficient way, but in a way that externalizes really significant impacts of that intervention into the community and into the environment. Now, First of all, am, am I right in, in making that rather um, brief assessment of, you know, one illustration of how the monies flow? And, um, and am I right to be concerned about that degree of consolidation and financialization, as well as the kind of um, the invisibility of those processes that are starting to dictate the direction of travel for a food system? The short answer is yes, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, you asked about, you know, you're asking about where do I stand on things? And I said, you know, writing that book, Feeding Britain, I was trying to say, uh, you know, I hope I've got more years to go, but at the end of 45 years so far of working on all of this, I, what do I think? What's my view? What's my assessment? My country is in a very interesting, strange, difficult, challenging place like many rich countries, it's got certain rich country problems, but it's also chosen not to do it in collaboration with its nearest neighbours. And yet here is that example near you on your doorstep of how you can't resolve that situation if you think it's just me, 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 Britain. You've got to resolve that by getting a grip of global food companies, cargo, ADM, you know, there are some giant corporations, a bit like now everyone's aware, Alphabet, Google, uh, you know, Microsoft, et cetera, they storm across the world. Um, they're, they're in control of this technology, not entirely, but heavily. Uh, there's less awareness uh, of a not dissimilar accrual of power uh, in the food system. And it seems to me, for me, it becomes an issue of democracy. As you know, Sue, I coined a long time ago, 25 years ago, a phrase, food democracy. And people said, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, 
I don't think it's healthy for a society and a political economy. It's a value statement I'm making. If so much power goes to very distant companies and you're seeing the geography, the pollution of a river um, and livelihoods being basically controlled by a board which parachutes into Britain, uh, but uh, is not a British company. Now that can't be resolved by Britain. It's got to be resolved internationally. That's got to be resolved by counterweight power. Uh, and that takes us into the political economy of food. So, you know, I'm a policy analyst, but in, in many languages, they don't make the distinction between policy and politics. And here's why they're right, actually. It, what, what becomes policy, cargo having a cluster, what we call an economic geography analysis, a cluster in that why ask area of yours. Um, that's happened all over the world. Tomato growing in uh, in uh, it, it used to be the case in in wine, for example, but then it got disrupted. The Australians, the Californians, uh, and in a sense, I think for ecological reasons, environmental reasons, human health reasons, there is beginnings to be beginning to be a very old argument, which is a more decentralized system better for us or a highly concentrated system better for us. There are some people who say, well, if cargo gets even more powerful over chicken, if we want to clean up the chicken industry, well, we just go knock on the door on cargo. I think that's fantasy, personally. That's not what happens. Um, so I think so, the argument for democracy is important. So let, let's, let's follow this one through, because I think this is really important. Very often, when, when you and I have conversations like this in, in other places, people will say to us, but, but this is consumer choice. If consumers didn't want it, they wouldn't produce it. And, and it must be what consumers want because they keep buying it. They may say they want high welfare chicken, but they're still buying the cheap chicken. What do you make of those kinds of arguments? I, well, I think it's a very powerful argument. Uh, uh, I, I think I was smiling. I was internally smiling listening to you because I've spent most of this week and bits of last week preparing to do a session, a webinar for the UN Food Systems Summit this week, which has now happened, uh, resurrecting an old idea that colleagues and I had in the 2000s that we very catchily, or I very catchily called the Omni label. Uh, in other words, we think consumers just want cheap chicken nuggets because they buy them, it must be true. Unpick it and say to people, as happened with uh, you know, Jamie Oliver and his exposés of, of chicken nuggets, it turned out people didn't have a clue what was in it. Uh, and they weren't so happy actually at all when they knew more. So what you tend to get in food systems as they get the supply chains get longer and more distant and less accountable, they only get mediated by that immediate point of sale in a supermarket where the price shouts out or the marketing or a picture of a happy chicken says, oh, this is chicken, so it must be all right. Uh, uh, the omni-label argument, by the way, is trying to say, well, with things like QR codes and sophistication of smartphones, it's incredibly easy to give consumers vastly more access to vastly more information so that if they do want to find out, they do. At the moment, they don't have a way of getting it. And I speak, I don't know what I look like uh, to our, our viewers or you, Sue, or Gary or whoever, uh, but I look normal, but I'm not. My brain is scarred by 15 years of arguing for quid labels. Now, does Sue Pritchard know what a quid label is? No, I don't. Okay, I'll tell you. Quid, quantitative ingredients declaration. It took 15 um, years to get the label in tiny writing on a printed brand <laughs> to say the biggest ingredient is the first one. It took mm. 15 years to get that, Sue. And when we then campaigned for 15 years to try and get pesticides labeled, back came the view, no, no, you don't need to know that. If you're worried about pesticide residues, because some people are, well, you can go and buy organic. 
But that's not what the theory of information flows and efficiencies of market says. It says consumers should be able to be informed and be informed, and then market efficiencies will work. Uh, the yes. reality is data yeah. and information themselves, themselves become a minefield and become a battleground. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think the, the, the data that, uh, that we looked at when we were producing our report a couple of years ago that really shocked me, actually, was that for, for every five million pounds that the government spends on healthy eating campaigns, yeah, that's right. industry is spending 200 million pounds on advertising junk food, junk food alone, food yeah. that it knows it is not good for us. And so I think it's... Um, you know, whilst I completely agree with you about clear and transparent labelling, there's nothing that irritates me more than what we call the faux farm label, you know, the, the brand that makes it look as though it's come from a farm, but the farm is just a fantasy brand. So e even though I agree with you that transparent and honest labelling is really critical, nonetheless, it seems quite an important set of questions to ask about the role of the industry in, in marketing and advertising in ever more subtle and sophisticated ways, you know, yeah, influences right. on Instagram and yeah. so on. You know, seeing, I mean, I think there's a, there's a little campaign that bite back the um, the young people's organisation against advertising, against inappropriate advertising, is just running at the moment on Twitter, where they're pointing out that the hundreds cricket series is being um, sponsored by the business that mark that, that, that is advertising junk foods on all of the shirts. Now, advertising junk foods in sport, surely that's a kind of basic uh, shift that we can make, recognizing that it's not, um, it's, it's just not okay anymore to, on the one hand, be trying to tell young people how to eat differently. And then on the other hand, that kind of subliminal messaging on a sporting jersey that you know, go for this unhealthy snack. That's right, absolutely, I'm spot on, I agree with you. Um, but, but this is as old as as the hills, you know. The, the capacity of people of businesses to pollute and adulterate food is not new, but the scale of it is what is new. That is seriously different, and the fact that information is itself the flow of battleground or, or the battleground terrain. Uh, itself that is new uh, and the reason those sweatshirts and the hundreds advertising is as it is the reason the, the the football stadiums are filled with food advertisements is because they want to associate the super fat watching the super fit as I call the Olympics or sports um, that really it's your fault if you're fat um, yeah. because you can be very, very thin and eat lots of chicken nuggets and big burgers and drink soft drinks ad nauseam, uh, mm -hmm. but you can burn it off, is what they're saying. So they're undermining very carefully and cleverly everything mm -hmm. that health education has tried to do. So, it, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm a social scientist, but I work a lot on public health um, and... Uh, come from a center where we do a lot of that sort of work. Um, public health is always trying to catch up on the, mm -hmm. an individualization of health. Mm -hmm. That is me, 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 my responsibility, you, 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 your fault. When in fact, mm -hmm. the issue is we, 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 us, 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 the, yeah. the system again. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Good. advertising, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure we might talk about the, the English National Food Strategy um, yes. And I understood many of the recommendations that were made. One that I regret didn't come forward. It, it had, a, I think, I'm very supportive of and love the fact that it recommended a tax on sugar and salt and trying to get at what we people like me call ultra processed foods, just unnecessarily factory production of foods and throwing in hidden ingredients, as you were rightly saying. Um, but taxing salt and sugar. I declare an interest. I'm on the scientific advisory groups of the British and the worldwide campaigns of those run from Queen Mary University of London for medical school there, um, just down the road from my university. Um, but I think we'd have a, a quicker and a nastier uh, route into this 
nastier, not for us, the public interest, but nastier for the other side, if we taxed advertising, if we taxed marketing. Yes. Uh, and those are arguments that, again, like my Omni label, we raised 10, 20 years ago and they didn't get much buy-in. Yeah. But I think now young people get it. They see the yeah. way in which they are being barraged all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the ex-psychologist in me, which is what my original training was, just mm -hmm. sees young people, their, their personas, their neuroses being fed, amplified. Mm -hmm exacerbated yes. by images designed around not their interests. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's come on to the national food strategy now. I think no. you, you just mentioned it, the, um, uh, the national food strategy produced by Henry Dimbleby, published just a couple of weeks ago. And um, you, I think, like me, will have been really thrilled to see the the really deep systemic analysis of the food system yes, um, that's that's throughout the report it's it's a big report it's 260 odd pages it's very well researched very well evidenced <coughs> the, the recommendations though kind of cut to the chase after the the, the the big body of analysis we we come down to basically four sets of recommendations the first henry calls escaping the junk food cycle and protecting the NHS. That's obviously a, a slogan that he knows has landed well through the COVID crisis. He talks about reducing diet related inequalities. And we'll come back to that. Um, he talks about making the best use of our land. Now, you will know, Tim, that that was a very strong recommendation that we made in our Future in the Land report. And he supports that and develops it somewhat. And then the last set of recommendations are about creating a long-term shift in our, in our food culture. So this first set of recommendations are, are about escaping the junk food cycle, protecting the NHS. I think perhaps we've touched on that, but let's talk about diet-related inequality. In, and, and Henry's very clear in the report that food poverty is not about food it's actually about poverty and I think he's he's very clear in saying that this isn't about um poor people making bad choices but about a system of inequality and poverty that creates that, that creates a whole mess of conditions that make it really really difficult for people who are living precarious lives either long term or even short term um to make the right kinds of food choices that will keep them keep them healthy. What did you make of those recommendations? Extending eligibility for free school meals, funding the holiday activities program, expanding the Healthy Start scheme, trialing a community eat well program. Do you think Henry went far enough with those recommendations? The answer is no, um, I don't. Um, uh, I was very glad, I, I think you were too, from what you said, with those four headlines. I thought the four headline foci, uh, focuses were, were, were good. Um, I was underwhelmed by the recommendations on breaking the junk food, food cycle. I think, you know, if you, if you want to be hard, you'd go for advertising and marketing and influencers, and you'd really try and get a grip of that. There's a lot of thinking gone on that in my own department. Um, uh, in my university, many universities, a lot of people thinking about that and and how to unravel that. What does it mean in competition theory and competition policy to have um, unelected people becoming influencers, getting at young people? Um, that's part of breaking out of and escaping from the junk food cycle. So I don't think it was hard enough at all. Uh, I thought he did the pragmatic thing for this government, the present politics of this government, which has a big majority in this right wing uh, and believes in the small state, but actually has been acting as a big state through Brexit, as we know, and also COVID-19. Uh, I thought he was pragmatic, but too cautious. And I've said this to him, uh, that I think bigger ideas were possible. 
Uh, I think it was too focused on children. Having said that, children are very important. But if we want to change the culture, just take public health and climate change, that can't wait 30, 40 years till today's children are adults and having children and got incomes and being their domestic influences. It's got to happen now. Look at the Committee on Climate Change. We've got to radically change the British diet now. We've got to change land use now. <laughs> the Met Office this week has just come out with a report saying these weather patterns we're having today are the new normal. It's not future climate change. It's already with us in the UK, not distant, not far off places. You can send money to Oxfam to solve your consciences. Eat us now. Wow. And that is surely a circumstance in which I think if I'd been on the inside track of that, of the Dimbleby inquiry, uh, and I parachuted in and out a few times, but I was not on the inside track, uh, uh, I would have said, have some gradations, have some radical demands, some not so radical, and then your pragmatic one. Because at the moment, it seemed like it was all just pragmatic and very small scale. Hard enough, he would say, and has said to me and others, he's not sure he's going to get those. Look at the prime minister dismissed immediately. Um, having not even read the report, not known for doing his homework, our Prime Minister, but dismissed it on populist grounds. Oh, no, they can't tax salt and sugar. The people wouldn't like that. Where's the evidence of that? Say that to the working class people down my street who've had a heart attack. They would like it taxed. Thank you very much indeed. Where's his evidence for dismissing it? But it was dismissed. So what that's done is immediately put some of the good central four ideas onto the back foot straight away. So I think that was a mistake, but, but, big but, Sue. What doesn't matter at all, and I'm no disrespect to Henry Zimbabwe, for whom I have a great deal of respect, and he's done a very interesting and difficult job in difficult political times, uh, because it wasn't easy doing this while COVID was going on, being taken off the job, and then civil servants given and removed, etc. So it's fantastic he's come up with what he's come up with. I really salute it, but, but. What matters now is the white paper in January. And what matters is the Food Act by 2023. The politics with a small P, and we presume the political parties with a big P, now starts. Mm -hmm. So I think for people like you and the commission, your commission, and little individual uh, academics like me and the people I work with, uh, now is the critical time, actually. Mm -hmm. the, the politics is all now, not what Mr. Dimbleby said, we can mm -hmm. criticise what Mr. Dimbleby said. It does not go far enough for the Health Committee of the House of Commons, for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee of the House of Commons. It doesn't go far enough when it comes to trade. Now, whether the Trade Committee would back something stronger, I doubt very much. But, but that politics has got to be one with the British public. So mm -hmm. I think he was too cautious, Sue, if I'm honest. I, yes, and I, and I completely understand why in the end um, he wanted to be practical. He wanted to be yeah, practical yeah. and um, uh, and achievable. And I think it, 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 we, we've, we've had similar debates over, over the last little while. Do you make big statements of what might be possible or do you try and focus on the things that are eminently achievable recommendations? And I think that's, you know, that's where Henry's landed. These are eminently achievable recommendations that can be easily implemented by by government Let, let's talk about the land use ones because as, yeah. as you as you know um this was a recommendation in our report and um as a result of esme fairburn's very generous support of us and now a partnership with the environment agency we're starting to pilot land use frameworks around the uk starting in devon moving across to cambridgeshire so we, we are very supportive of um processes to negotiate and mediate all of the different requirements we place on land these days from food and nature recovery through to flood prevention through to energy infrastructure housing and so on and it kind of gets to the big one of the big challenges i think that we're facing the the, the version of the future for agriculture that that henry kind of um deals with by the use of the three compartment model in some parts of the country um, 
we'll see more ecosystem restoration or rewilding as some people like to call it. And in some parts of the country, we'll see more intensive food production. And then in other parts of the country, we will see high nature value, um, extensive agriculture systems that um, what we call agroecology and in fact what we commend very well. What, what did you make of that set of recommendations and the way that Henry um, dealt with those conundrums? I conundra? thought it was, yes. yeah, conundra. Uh, <laughs> if we taught Latin as I was, it's conundra. Uh, <laughs> the conundrums is what most English would say. Um, I, I understand what it, why he came up with what he came up with. Um, I now raise an issue that I talked with him, with Henry Dimbleby directly about that he raised but didn't resolve in the report, which for me, when you asked me right at the beginning, what, what do I think is most important? I said money flows. And I'm now going to go against myself and say, actually, a fundamental question that he fudged, sorry, not fudged, ducked. Mm. And I don't say that rudely. I understand why he ducked it, was should Britain grow more of its own food, yes or no? Uh, and he cites me in, in that uh, and sort of, lumps at us with, with uh, sort of langists, <laughs> if you like. Um, and I know why, because that's what government, this government doesn't want to do. But it's actually what any state has to do. Let me give an example. Singapore, uh, at the present last year, was feeding about 10% of itself from its own land. It's decided to trouble that to 30% because it looks around Asia Pacific region and says, we're in trouble. All of this is disruptable. Singapore, this city-state powerhouse, is really at risk if it can't feed itself well. Now, um, you could say Britain, sixth richest economy in the world, doesn't need to worry, can always buy on world markets. Really? I'm not so sure about that. Britain doesn't control that it can control, hasn't got a navy that can protect long supply lines, has just voted to leave uh, where it gets its food, most of its imported food from, uh, 24 miles away through the tunnel, which by the way is controlled and policed by a private police force. Um, you know, what's the function of the state here, Sue? It's not able to protect and defend the British, let alone say we should be using, I haven't forgotten your question, using our land better. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Henry Dimbleby in his report just gives one model of land use across the country. And by the way, you in Wales, I am partly Welsh in blood, as you know. Uh, I was insulted, actually, that the map put Wales down as built. Yeah. It just said built. I mean, give me a break. Wales is not built. My mm. grandfather and great grandfathers had enormous gardens and produced vast amounts of food mm. perfectly happily in North Wales. Anglesey, where I have family, was the breadbasket for North Wales. That's why there are 70 ruined um, mills all over there. It could be growing a lot more at the moment. But look at the National Food Strategy, brilliantly and rightly, it said, look, 85% of UK land, which is under cultivation, feeds animals, feeds cows and pigs and chickens. This is not a good use of land. If we look at climate change, Sue, quick answer, you would say decentralized land use. You wouldn't concentrate it in a new breaking up of the map. You'd say to the northeast of England, where can you grow more horticulture? You'd say to the northwest of England, where can you grow more? You'd say to my home county, I was born in Lincoln, flat Lincolnshire, which is going underwater. And all the calculations say by the year 2070, 2080, it'll probably have three foot more water. The fens will be underwater. What about round Blackpool and the moss between Liverpool and Manchester? They used to feed Manchester and Liverpool no longer. There's what, as I said in my book, one farm is producing horticulture there now. You would decentralize that, Sue. You wouldn't have Henry's map. That's a very different model that we need to argue about. I would re regionalize. And at the end of my book, you know, peer reviewers said, come on, Tim, you've given this enormous analysis of the complexity of food, come up with your solutions. So I then spent another six months just working out, hammering out, talking, thrashing out, 
what became 33 recommendations. One of my recommendations was to re-regionalize Britain, to re-regionalize food decision-making, to say to the Northeast, you get on with it. If, if the politicians can't agree how to have regions in England, well, there are eight regions which are actually there already. Use those and get going. Use mm -hmm. the LEPs, rebuild the LEPs, the local enterprise partnerships, mm -hmm. and turn them into food, food bioregional positions. That would be a very different take on what his map would look like soon. Yeah. So I'm going to come now to issues of food security and food resilience, which you've written on very recently with um, Terry Marsden and Eric Eric Milston. You you very um, passionately point out that these are not interesting abstract questions. These have an immediacy and a materiality that perhaps we've never known before with climate and the nature crisis, what we grow, where we grow it, what we take responsibility for growing in this country are now critical questions of national security. And in your paper um, produced just this month, you talk about the nine principles and tests for long-term UK food security and resilience. Tell, tell us a bit more about those tests and those principles that you think any action, any governmental action or business action needs to meet for us to have um, a somewhat more promising future? Yeah, I mean, well, thank you. Um, that's a very big question for us to begin to draw together um, at the end of this very interesting discussion for which thank you. Um, we set out, the we being my two dear and long-term professor friends, Eric Milston at Sussex, a science policy analyst, and Terry Marsden, a, a, a planner, economic geographer, et cetera. Uh, so very different in our skills and our interests. And we said, look, if we had three minutes, you do in policy the three minutes for the prime minister test. Mm -hmm. OK, so what do you want? Super chart. You know, well, we said, well, give me more money. You know, but forget it. You've just lost your three minutes. So we said, actually, the critical issue for the prime minister is food security for Britain and a different version of food security, the capacity to bounce back after shocks. That's mm -hmm. this word resilience, because mm -hmm. we're entering a, a world where shocks are going to be normal. Flooding of prime agricultural land is going to be normal. Flooding of chicken sheds is going to be normal. And we're not, we haven't designed things for that. Just go away and look at the National Infrastructure Commission soon, which I'm sure you read nightly. It's cheaper than drugs and alcohol. Uh, I do, actually. <laughs> uh, well, me too. This is a critical body looking unusually yes. for the British state 50 years ahead, and it's not looking at food. One of my recommendations is it should do. Yeah. And the answer has to be bioregionalism, has to be decentralizing these issues. So food security isn't just having food available, but it's having people in a strong state of mind. Uh, social resilience, social security, to be able to afford food, to be confident about food, to know how to deal with it under any circumstances. I mean, I, I used to be a farmer, as you know, but I'm a, a very active gardener. I'm not a farmer anymore, uh, but I'm very, very committed. I'm, I'm on a, 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 a president of a gardening organization. Um, there are nine million gardeners in Britain. It's the big, big connection between growing food and consuming food that Britain has actually. We're not using that, not but yet in World War II, we did, and it was very effective. I'm not saying for Armageddon reasons we should do it in quite that way, draconian way, but I think we could actually be thinking much better about that. And here to salute Henry Dimbleby, I thought there were lovely ideas about building community resilience, but I would like it everyone down the, you know, I've got neighbors who are bankers and journalists and lawyers, as well as people who are very poor. Uh, you know, I like all of them to take that more seriously, not just thinking they can buy their way out of it for the rich. Actually, Britain is not in a good place when it comes to food security and food resilience. It's very weak. It's very fragile in all sorts of ways I went into in my book. So what we did in our nine tests and principles paper called Testing Times from uh, through the food research collaboration into university civil society collaboration, as you know, Sue, um, 
what we did was say, dear British public, here are nine principles, we three old gets. <laughs> we think these are the tests we should apply to the process Britain is now going to go through, through the Dimbleby report to the white paper to uh, the, the law. And that's not to exclude Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, but basically England's the big brother. And England's got to grow up and decentralise and start being nicer to its neighbour. Oh, have you frozen? Or? Oh, okay. So, um, so I'm going to pick up the two, the two toward the end, actually, that I think are very interesting and important. And actually, the last one relates to a question that we've got in the chat from Keith Best. The last two, you talk about food science and technology should serve the public. I think that's yeah. another of those hidden um, parts of the system that very often people just don't understand. The, the amount of money that goes into particular kinds of high tech, um, marketable um, technological innovations and, and a small amount of money that goes to um, farmer led innovation, for example, or citizen led innovation. And then the last principle that you touch on is that food work should be skilled, safe and properly remunerated. Yet another way that we as taxpayers underwrite a dysfunctional food system. When people are not paid enough, we are contributing through our tax credits, through tax credits to um, make sure that people can you know, um, can afford to live. Absolutely. Do you, do you, do you want to pick up the, those those two points again? Yeah, the, um, well, the, 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 the latter one first. I think the skills councils are really important, not, not getting their due influence, um, aren't working together. Um, in my book, I called for a new generation of agri-food technology uh, mm -hmm. colleges. You know, in the, in the 19th century, County councils were encouraged by the then fledgling Board of Agriculture to create new colleges of agriculture, borrowing the ideas of the older ones like Y College, closed yeah. down by Imperial College, and you know, some of the, the Devons and so on. I think we need new big thinking about skills and consumer education and skills training for an agroecological, more decentralized, more people-oriented food system. So there are lots of ideas my colleagues and I in the Testing Times report mooted. But what we tried to do, Sue, and we had our eyes and our minds focus on parliamentary processes. You know, if you're in the Lords or if you're in the Parliamentary Select Committee, you need to think of things that you can ask questions about and hold ministers to account. And I think our nine principles are pretty good. Work, linking human health and, and, and environmental health around ecological principles. These are useful principles. If anyone's interested who's listening or watching us, just go and download that paper, Testing Times Food Research Collaboration. Have a look and vary them, move them, change them yourself. But there's a lot of thinking that has gone on, your own excellent uh, commission. And I loved, I must salute you, the, the bit of your two years big process that I utterly love was the stories, the stories of the farmers and the growers and where they were. Just listening to people is a critical issue. And on the, the, the first point you raised through at me, inequalities and social inequalities, a lot would be benefited from, from just listening to people who are on low incomes. And let's be very clear, the problem is not poverty, the problem is inequality. And that takes us into politics again. And I know why Henry Dimbleby ducked and died from that. You know, he's a good pragmatist in that respect. He was a business consultant, for goodness sake. Um, but but I, I still think there is room for having harder hitting and longer range recommendations that will be floating and that we need those now. And that's what I tried to do in my book and we tried to do in our testing times report. Why do I say those are needed? It's because I think events are going to move very fast indeed, Sue. Mm. I don't expect business as usual in any way for this government to, to be as they are in three years' time. They're going to change rapidly. Mm -hmm. We're coming to the end of our conversation, sadly, and I could talk to you all night, um, but um, listeners on, on, on the podcast will be relieved to, to see that we are just about coming to the end. But I'm just going to ask you one final question by way of why um, of, of wrapping up you you 
you're, you're iconoclastic in your delivery of the, of the real challenges um, that we face in the UK and globally. And your analysis is trenchant and direct and, and hard hitting. What is it that gives you some optimism? What is it that gives you optimism that if we keep going, we might see a change? I, I always have to, I smiled immediately because I get asked this a lot. Um, for obvious reasons. Um, and I always think fondly of my mother, uh, who was very different to me, and always said that I was as I was because I was a breech baby. In other words, I came out backwards. And I think uh, as an academic, that's a very good start in life, actually, because it means you're optimistic despite the evidence. I'm optimistic despite the evidence. But, but having said that, I'm optimistic because I think the people get it. It goes right back to the beginning of our conversation, Sue, that I think people are getting systems thinking. They're getting the connections much more than 30, 40 years ago. And I'll now tell a story against myself very quickly to end. When I started, I came down to London after about 10 years of working on this for what I thought was going to be a year's job. And it turned into well, 35, 37 years that I've been here. Um, and I used to meet all the, the very elderly people who'd been in Second World War planning. And they used to take, you know, they were lords, ladies, sirs, knights, queens, surgeons and things, the great and the good. And they'd take me to one side and they said, as I, I quote one very famous epidemiologist who said, Tim, you think you're being radical, but you're not being radical enough. In other words, they were saying, you're being too pragmatic just think much more fundamentally about what is needed. So I'm sorry if it sounds trenchant, but I'm trying to follow their advice. And these were people who cut it. They really cut it, Sue. And they had to sort out national diet when Britain had no food in the larder. Lord Walton broke every law in treasury purchasing by buying the entire Canadian wheat crop illegally and made everyone's hair stand on end. But if he hadn't done that, and if the Nazis had actually just circled Britain in 1939, we wouldn't be here now in the way that we're talking. Mm -hmm. So I'm someone who thinks radical thinking in, the, in the, the Latin sense of radix, root, getting to the root of the problem, is what we have to do. And with climate change, with health emergencies, with inequalities worldwide, now is a time for radical thinking. So I'm not going to apologize for radical thinking. I'm an optimist because of that. I think we can farm and grow food and eat food in a better way. But the final thing, Sue, what gives me optimism is, wow, I've seen Britain change. It used to be a complete... I was brought up in India as a child and came back. British food was brown. It was brown. Now it's not. And that's Europeanization and globalization. And the British have actually really improved on lots of fronts, but it's been dire for lots of people as well. So there's a very optimistic take of what we, where we are at the moment. But wow, we've got some big troubles ahead. Yeah. But I'm an optimistic despite the evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And I think the thing that gives me a great sense of optimism, you, you cite yourself in, in the, those nine principles right at the end the the number of people the number of organizations communities citizens groups and indeed businesses too who are now yeah, coming businesses together too. in a broad alliance to say we need to change it just it, it gives me great 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 hope and optimism that we are facing into the challenges and the direction of travel we're going to have to take i, Gary, I agree I, I, I agree. Before we get to Gary, I agree there is a consensus for the taking. Um, my colleagues and I try to garner that, that consensus, and you've tried to do that too in the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. I think that consensus is actually inevitably pretty radical, actually. Mm -hmm. So, Tim, thank you very much. That, that has been a hugely interesting uh, conversation. You've covered an enormous amount of ground. Uh, you've given our audience a great deal to think about, not just practical considerations, but also moral considerations around uh, many of these issues. And I think if I take away anything, and I certainly will from this conversation, it is about that sense of urgency 
Uh, I think the phrase you used, Tim, was now is the critical time. There is a white paper in January, a Food Act in 2023. You've referenced, of course, the Dimbleby report, uh, the various potential tax issues, and also uh, the importance, absolutely fundamental importance, of young people and, and their role in, in all of this. Uh, quite selfishly, I can see uh, a great deal of work for St George's House uh, yeah. to, to contribute uh, to this debate, and we, we will certainly want to do that. So thank you both very much. Uh, and if I may just say to our audience as well, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're uh, not going to have any conversations in August, but we will be back in September with uh, further conversations in this series. If you've missed any of the earlier conversations, you can still pick up most of them on the uh, St. George's House website. But if we were in the Vicar's Hall, I would now be saying to you, please join me uh, in uh, applauding both Sue and Tim. We can't do that in person, but perhaps we can do it virtually. Thank you. Uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Tim. Uh, and to everybody, please keep safe, keep well, and good night.